This is, of course, the sort of central location for Blazing in our studio, and there's so much material that Pratt provides for you in the context of this class to work with. And, um, you know, I'm always kind of amazed at that, and it's really, um, but it's a lot to learn about. So we're going to start that today. But before we begin all the how to's and the strategies about painting, I want to talk about what Glaze is. A little bit because you know you can't get very far away from the earth when you're in ceramics <laughs> you can't get far away from the chemistry and the transformation chemical transformations so glaze like a cartoon sketch of what glaze is a ceramic glaze is composed of three main ingredients the first is silica which is the glass forming part and silica can be found in nature in a very popular location. Where's that? Lots of it. The beach, yeah, yeah. it's sand, right? That's a really, we have no shortage yet of silica on this planet, okay? That's not, uh, it's not what we think of with climate issues yet. If you were to heat silica on its own to a high enough temperature, it would fuse into a glassy material. But that leads us to the second ingredient of glaze, the ceramic glaze, which is called flux, F-L-U-X. And the role of flux, now the thing about silica being a glaze on its own is the melting point of all clay is much lower than the melting point of sand, so your forms would melt down before the glaze did in the fire. So the flux, which is many different types of natural minerals and materials or, flux, or ceramic fluxes, the flux lowers the melting point of the silica so it melts before the clay does. That's mm -hmm. one role. The second role, it's responsible for the movement of the glaze when it melts. So when you see a glaze that runs, you know, like pulls down and is really molten, you can see it travels, it has more flux in it. The third thing that flux provides usually is, is the texture of the glaze. So the more flux percentage, the glossier your glaze will be. The less, the more matted it will be. So you can control that aspect usually with the flux proportion and the type of flux. Now, before we move on to the third ingredient, we also use flux as a noun. They're actually flux materials, but we also use it as a verb. So when we in ceramics talk about something fluxing, we're talking about at the moment in the firing where things are chemically transforming and moving. So it's like for glaze, it would be the melting point where what is a sort of a dry um, solution of material becomes glass. And, it's, and it, in that moment, it moves. It melts, and it melts with gravity working on it as a coating, and it melts into the porous form. That's the moment it attaches and becomes integrated with the form by fluxing into it. The third ingredient, third necessary ingredient, is called alumina, A-L-U-M-I-N-A. -A. And alumina is added, again, there are many different types of, of materials that are uh, in this category of alumina, but they, it's added for strength and adhesion of the glaze. So the glaze on its own, what keeps it as together at the melting point into a sheet that stays attached and stays consistent without breaking up is this alumina. It provides that kind of tensile strength for the glassy coating it will become. So those are the three main ingredients of all ceramic glazes, but almost all of them have a fourth ingredient. It's not required, but they have it, which is color. And we've already talked about all fired ceramic colors made up of metal. And um, as before, cobalt, copper, iron, manganese, tin, rutile, there's there's many, many metals that are used in ceramic glazes to make the full spectrum of color. So, that's what glaze is. And what we've done for you, we have um, materials that we call our shop glazes that are mixed from recipes by our staff. And they're here for you to use as a starting point for your own experimentation. This is the menu, okay? It's a menu that is, um, you'll see it's a great way to shop 
to begin your research because each glaze is then chosen for specific unique qualities that it has to create more of a diverse vocabulary for you to play with. All of these tiles, we went over this last time we were talking about the undercover. This is the Timaku gold over all the different colored slips that were fired on in the disc. So you can see that underpainting has great impact on the quality of the glaze surface. It can be, this is not about doing a tight, small brush painting of the Mona Lisa on a teacup and putting a clear over it, although of course that's a possibility. It can also be a very, your underpainting can be a very subtle way to dictate a change on the surface. So you can play with burying the color or letting the color come up. Um, and of course that can vary around an object. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. These were dipped, and in the dipping, there's a flooding that builds a heavier coating. If this was brushed, you'd see a whole other glaze effect. So the other part of your research is keeping track of the thicknesses, the overlays, what went underneath, what is over, what's touching what, what's separate and not touching. You have to capture it with confidence so that when all this transformation happens, which is dazzling, and you're gonna say, oh my God, I'm in love, or oh my God, what happened? Or somewhere in between. But all of it is only valuable to someone who's trying to develop a, 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 cap, a vocabulary or a palette of glaze that they can count on if you know what happens. So we've talked about a glaze journal and how to, you can, there's a million different ways to do that. Of course you have a phone with pictures before and after. All of that can be very helpful. Okay. So when you're shopping for glaze, you have to know some are designed for maximum fluxing. This is one of them. So this is a pretty heavy dip too. This glaze where it's thinner breaks, what we call breaks, over the edges to make a thinner coating and that's where the white clay is coming through, the thinner. Imagine this melting and gravity really pulling it. This was an even coating of raw material. This texture happens in thicker. It's the same glaze, this is thicker. And you can see we ground down a bead of material that glued from the side. It traveled all the way past the ceramic and glued to the shell. So this was all ground down after with our grinding room. So this one is not one you can layer with a lot of different glazes and expect stability. Okay, so this would be not that tight, but it's a very exciting glaze, as you can see. This object is the same glaze, and this was applied with the spray booth. Oh, wow. So you can see it didn't quite, it did get a little thicker, but it's a very different effect with the buildup of a spray versus the flooding from a dip or a pour. So this, so that's why this is all just a starting point for you. You can, you know, you can have one glaze and get infinite kind of looks from it according to how it's applied in the bin. Okay, and then of course we have some that are designed to be translucent colors so you can see more active impact from underpainting or the clay itself or texture. These tend to flow or flux into the low parts of a uh, texture, leaving more of an enhancement of the changes in the surface. This is not what I would use for text texture by flooding it, because it flattens it. It evenly coats the high points and the low points. Okay, for, you might want to edit. You know, it's not about right or wrong. It's just about really understanding that you're building a series. You really want to some degree, I think, in ceramic, when you're making a ceramic, to, to be aware that you're making a history for your viewer or your audience of your touching. And if you handle it well, there's some translucency through all the way to when the clay was wet, when things you did to it when it was drier, and then these coatings also have translucency through. So that's one way you might approach to build up a lot of it. Okay, so what I want to do now is um, go through some simple technical 
I call them problem solving exercises. Um, and I'm gonna let everyone have an interactive moment here because there's something about just breaking the ice on the physical act of glazing that I think will be helpful. It, it's look, it sort of looks a little bit basic, but I think you're gonna appreciate it. So the first problem you might wanna solve in a glaze studio is, pretend like this is bisqueware, not a fire cup. You have a small object and you want one evenly saturated coat of the same glaze inside and out. You just want it to be as saturated and even as possible. That's the first problem. So we have a, you know, a big enough container of material that that's very viable, like just by dipping it in and out. So it's not quite as straightforward <laughs> as it might seem, so that's why we're going through it. So let me get, um, now the next thing I need to say to you is, we have every size glove, as I pointed out before. This is a moment where you might want to partake of that. The glaze that I'm going to ask you to interact with today has no colorants. So there's nothing to protect. You don't have to go about for this today, okay? There's nothing that will hurt you. It's a clear glaze. Um, if it has color, though, it's metal, and that's when you want to protect. So I'm going to ask, um, I believe the clear is not on the trolley. It's over here. They're all labeled. They all have these screw-off tops. It's very important because very often when you're here glazing, there's others behind you with other things to protect the bucket by always covering it after you're in and out so that nothing can fall in there and contaminate it. And that what you're putting in to stir it is clean. The protocol here is once you've used it, immediately clean it and hang it back so that if you're if you're grabbing something, you know it's coming. Mean, that's really the best protocol we have. Clear glaze, so all the glazes are mixed from all those three categories, some of color, dry mixed, to a recipe by gram, so each gram matters to the outcome chemically. Then water is added, and then we sieve them. All that, we sieve them into this finer mesh three times so that the solution is very fine and not chunky so that that ends up with the even coating of glaze. They're handmade with a lot of labor, in other words. So anyway, I'm gonna take the whisk and stir from the bottom. You wanna make sure that every bit, every gram of those materials that were mixed and set are up in suspension in the water before using it. Some you'll find, and we're probably the first group that is glazing this semester, so some will be hard settled with the water on top. But even if someone just went in before you, I would always stir the glaze before I used it, just because some settle faster. Each glaze has a different personality as raw material, just like it does when it's fired. Okay, I almost always use the lid as a coaster for the dirty things because drops of glaze on the floor, which I'm now making, <laughs> that didn't work out well, so there we go, that's what I used to do. Um, drops of dry glaze have the same dust potential as, drop, as clay, dry clay. That silica that's shared in both clay and glaze is what causes the lung issues, right? So we just minimize that as, you know, just be aware if you can. So now I have some mixed up clear glaze. To be honest with you, most times, ooh, that doesn't look good. Something, oh, I wonder what that is. That's rust from steel wool that I stored in this cup. Hold on. Uh, remind me never to do that again. Okay, I think that's good enough. So, with clear, I always do this clear thing talk because people say, oh, I've done all this underpainting, I just want a clear clay. So it's just all going to be carried by this really stable clay-based color that is perfectly fine. You have about 20,000 years of people doing that behind you, it's, it's, a, it's a thing. 
Just so you know, though, clear is passive visually, but aggressive chemically. So the thicker the clear, the more it'll eat into your underpainting and make it what seems more opaque and saturated, more translucent. It could even soften the edges of the material and make them softer and less graphic. So controlling the thickness of clear is important. It's the only glaze we have that doesn't show where it's thick and thin because there's no color to record it. So you can use a brush and really get to a nice surface with no worries of that streakiness that would come with, you know, um, if it had color. So here's the technique. Watch carefully. Because you're going to look at me and go, why is he showing us this? This is so stupid. So here, the thing with, this is not going to behave like this square, by the way. This square is like so thirsty. This is going to be like, it just be. Okay, so one of the challenges of working, as we always do in the glaze room, is we're working with this thirsty fire clay of bisqueware, is the, the bisqueware will absorb more glaze than it can handle if you allow it to. So if I keep the bisqueware under the level of this, it'll just keep absorbing, 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 and then either in the drying process, before it's fired, it'll crack off, or if it holds on, it'll likely eject off from the wall instead of stick to the piece. Each thickness of wall has the different capacity to hold a different amount of glaze. So the thinner forms hold less, and the thicker forms can hold a little more. Okay, so that's something you have to think about. But let's pretend like we're still back to our problem. So I want, I want to flood this without interventions with my hands minimal interventions with my hands. So I'm going to select my thumb on the top. I know there will there, be a bald spot of no glaze underneath my thumb. And then I'm going to hold the bottom almost always. We clear the glaze away anyway from the bottom. So that's not an issue. No handle holding. This square has been strengthened through its firing, but it's still weak enough that the liquid could snap it off. Okay, so I'm just not going to do that. So here's the trick. To get an even coating in and out, I just want to go in once. Well, I don't want to double dip, because even if I bring it out, it will add a second. So I want to go in, it's like a 1,000, 2,000. But, but I don't want to trap air, because then there'll be, the air will keep the glaze from sticking in the inside. Okay, so here's the technique. I'm going to go halfway in, and before the second part of this traps the air, I'm going to turn it right side up and then push it down to release the air, and then I'm gonna bring it out and drain. It's the same muscle that you all had when you were on the Corvette as the homecoming queen, waving, okay? <laughs> it's in your wrist, yep. Here is the sound of not doing that. Do you remember what that sounds like? Yeah. So I'm gonna go halfway, right side up and down. What is sneaky about this is it's counterintuitive to put it right side up and push it down. So that's where people get a little mind-body disconnect. Okay, I'm going to do it one more time. And then what I'd like for you all to do, you don't have to glove up again, is just come, I'm going to kind of wipe it down. It's not absorbing into this piece, but everybody can pick this up and do the same thing. Now that would be a really nice coating Clear. Now usually you'll start to see it absorb very quickly. The water goes into the wall of the porous bisqueware and you'll be able to move it over here. Okay, to finish drying, there'll be a bald spot here. I can take the extra and just fill in that one spot. I'm going to clean the rest back into the bucket and then I can go wash my hand. Okay, um, this can be handled once You'll see it stabilize and you can touch it without disturbing it. Um, I'm going to just kind of make this a little bit less slimy so you guys can handle it more easily as you come in. Okay, and this. Um, okay, so uh, 